I'm now delighted to uh, introduce to you Jane Morris, who is Vice President uh, of this organization, the European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, Jane has worked in many challenging fields throughout her career, uh, and she's former Deputy Speaker of the first Northern Ireland Assembly that was set up after the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement, uh, which was a great uh, success of diplomacy, and I imagine not an easy job to take on. And she's former head of the European Commission office in Northern Ireland and previously a reporter with the Great British Broadcasting Corporation. Um, you're currently Deputy Chief Commissioner of the Northern Ireland <laughs> Equality Commission. And there are lots of other things you've achieved, but I will uh, hand over to you, Jane. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Chair. Robin. Uh, good, good. Wait a minute. Good morning and welcome. Is it right? <laughs> I've just learned. I've just learned the sign language, and that was applause. I think. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I remember that. I'm trying to bring that in in future to things that I do. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here uh, on this uh, on this what is certainly a learning curve for me, but an important congress for you all. Um, I, I, I'm slightly aware of being in the, in the presence of, uh, of such experts uh, in an area in which I'm only really uh, starting to scratch the surface, a relative newcomer in this area. I am, as you've heard, a communicator by profession, but that was the old school, uh, journalist, broadcaster, turned, etc. Uh, and, uh, but you can see that communication is totally and utterly in my blood. Uh, only recently. I've been adapting to the new school uh, way of communicating. Uh, but I have to admit that the E word still sends shivers down my spine. Um, I'm fascinated by the cloud and the net and the web and digits and all of these this stuff, but I'm still slightly intimidated by them. So I'm sort of, and, and even by the way the language associated with it, so uh, I, 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 I've sort of got a, an understanding of, of the issues you're addressing today. Uh, but of course, the inclusion isn't, is about people who are an awful lot worse off than me, and that's something hugely important. Uh, when it comes to understanding not only the ecosystem, that's a wonderful word, uh, but also taking advantage of the opportunities that this new world offers, and you all know they are huge. So from where I stand, I have a certain understanding uh, of, of, of where they are and what you're discussing today. Uh, that, if you like, is a very long-winded way of saying, I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> um, as Vice President for Communication, I'm, my job is to increase the visibility uh, of uh, not just the committee, but of the work that we do. So I'm going to spend the next seven and a half minutes, if time allows, uh, letting you know what the committee is and does, and, and, and the work that we've done, and particularly on this topic. Um, good description. I, I, I wonder how many of you are well acquainted with the work of this committee, but I won't look for hands up. I'll just repeat it because uh, it, it's some people describe us, the Economic and Social Committee, as the best kept secret in Brussels. <laughs> but sometimes the best kept secret is quite useful because people want to know about it. Uh, we have 353 members from 28 member states speaking 23 different languages. So quite a challenge, uh, especially uh, when you're in the chair in the plenary sessions. Uh, we're appointed for a five-year period and many of us have our own day jobs back home. Uh, I'm, as you said, uh, uh, in the Equality Commission in Northern <coughs> Ireland and another challenge as you could well imagine. Um, our members come from all, all walks of life. Uh, I, I, often, I say uh, from, from scientists to scouts to s leaders of Solidarność. Uh, a fascinating bunch of people that really, uh, uh, with wide, huge, wide-ranging experience. Uh, we are divided into three groups, and that's employers, employees, and various interests. And that's how we get to get, our job is to scrutinize uh, EU legislation. Uh, we are, uh, the lawmakers are required by the treaty to consult us. We're a cons uh, consultative body, an advisory body, but they're not obliged to take on board what, they, what we say in our opinions. However, they are well advised to because they're good ones. 
Um, and let's talk about what we've been doing on, on e-inclusion. We have a permanent study group on the digital agenda, 15 of our members, and they meet regularly to plan our response to all the, uh, e the EC proposals on uh, digital agenda. And our most recent opinions are were on the digital single market, cyber security, cross-border electronic transactions, and one that's very close to my heart, responsible use of the internet. Something that's hugely important at the moment. We organise a series of stakeholder events every year, and next year we plan two events in the countries holding the presidency, that's uh, Greece and Italy. Uh, in debates on inclusion, the EESE consistently calls for more concrete and more ambitious EU efforts to support access for all to all internet and ICT tools. Um, I mean, I suppose that's the bottom line. Uh, last May we adopted an opinion on the accessibility of public websites uh, and the rapporteur, I don't know whether any of you come across him, Ask Anderson from Denmark who is himself blind. So he was the rapporteur on the opinion. Uh, it regrets that many categories of public body websites uh, aren't covered by the EC proposal um, and says the public sector doesn't lead by example. Uh, web accessibility needs a critical share of the European ICT market and should provide additional job opportunities for people with and without disabilities. Um, a separate opinion on enhancing digital literacy and the rapporteur was a French woman, Madame Batu, and it was 2011. It calls for uh, an intergenerational strategy using ITC to link generations and reduce isolation, an accessibility strategy, a design for all requirement covering equipment and software in homes, transport and construction, etc. Uh, a social justice strategy providing accessible software for low-income earners and minority groups, free public internet services at urban hotspots and in deprived areas, and an education strategy, ICT training for disadvantaged users, affordable phone, internet and other media access for training, and software with skilling content. Uh, so that's just a, a, a flavour of the sort of work we've been doing. But one thing that we are always reminded of is that working towards zero E exclusion makes economic sense. And I think you know very well that in the uh, European Economic and Social Committee, using an economic argument is always much more valuable than a social argument. Uh, it's a pity. That's the way things are still. Uh, but it makes economic sense. Uh, the European telecommunications market is in a saturation phase and industries are worried about no profit margin, etc, etc, leading to lack of investment, uh, but yet too many citizens are not using digital media. I was astounded by the figures in the briefing note I got. I, I, in fact, I don't have them in my head, but I, th I think I see certainly millions and millions, a hundred million <coughs> of the figures. Uh, I don't access it. Uh, we're, uh, that surprised me that we're so far behind. Uh, but uh, and, and, and the potential for that for growth and jobs etc is huge. Uh, the digital internal market as a driver <coughs> for growth needs to combine strong economic governments and strong e inclusion measures in order to overcome the inequalities in ICT access. Uh, most important perhaps is that the EU should finally recognise that access to ICT infrastructure is a fundamental citizen's right. Uh, and I don't know where you are, I suppose you're, we are all on that page. Uh, the use of public uh, ICT infrastructure, especially broadband and computing resources in schools and libraries, has huge potential for, boast, uh, for boosting web accessibility. Uh, a very good example uh, of the positive impact of digital intermediaries, and I had to discover what that was, obviously, I've discovered schools and libraries, etc. It was presented in our Going Local event in Latvia in 2012. And in just six years, apparently, Public Libraries for Progress, it's a programme in Latvia, led to all 874 public libraries of Latvia 
transforming themselves into modern information knowledge community centres. Uh, we have a document on that which is accessible to anyone who wants it, showing all the work that was done and, uh, and the pioneering uh, work that it is in that field. Um, just recently, uh, we in the ESC took stock of the progress that's been done in this area and we came up with a clear analysis and recommendations. Uh, we say, the digital economy is growing and creating jobs, but the massive ICT skills gap in the EU at a time of high unemployment is nothing short of appalling. Digital growth is vital, especially in the most economically challenged regions. The recent EU budget cuts for broadband rollout hurt the poorer regions of the EU the most and increase the digital divide and jeopardize e inclusion. The EESC wants access to high speed broadband to be recognized as a universal right of all citizens, regardless of location. And the EESC would like to see the creation of a charter of digital rights for all citizens. In conclusion, therefore, I want to leave you with one main message. The huge potential of the digital economy that we vitally need in Europe to move away from this crisis we're in will only be realised if the effort is an inclusive and a collaborative one. Uh, no single organisation, no single citizen should be left aside if we want to reap the fruits of this, what I'm describing as an information revolution. I wish you all a very fruitful day and I invite you to stay connected for our common goal to build an inclusive digital Europe. Thank you very much indeed. So while you just have to think what you'd like to ask about the work at the ESC, can I just um, abuse my position as chair to ask you, when it comes to advocating to the Commission, given what you were saying about your role as advisory and scrutinising, but not them not having to take your advice, what works best in this town? If we're coming from all over Europe to Brussels and we want to connect with policy makers and connect with Commission officials, what, what do you find as a tactic or a a way of dealing with things that's effective here that we could all use or learn from? 00322 You might say that again. So you might <laughs> <say> that again. <laughs> 00322 That's the phone call of the, uh, that's the operator service of the European Commission. Now this is a very interesting thing to tell you because obviously I've come from as head of the office in Belfast, I used to have ship owners and ship builders coming to me, how do I get in touch with, how do I lobby? I pick up the phone and ring them. Uh, the, guys, the guys and girls who are, who are writing the stuff uh, are sitting at their desks, and certainly back in those days, now that was the early 90s, maybe things have changed, but certainly back in those days, they answered their phone and they, and they said, you know, how can we help? It's the, it was the most accessible public uh, uh, administration that I've, I've ever come across. Compared to Belfast and London, I don't know, I don't know what that's like. Now, of course, that that's, was my advice back then. Nowadays, I would obviously say, you know, do come, come to us, get, get, get everyone you know in, in the area uh, on board. So it's the Economic and Social Committee, it's Commission officials, it's it's a member of the European Parliament. Uh, it's, it's get them all and, and use them. Uh, and I think you're doing it. You're doing it very well. Uh, now, maybe you're in the lucky position where, I'm going to say flavour of the month, that's, that's, a, that's, that's an unfair thing. It's, it's, it's a very obviously hugely important area you're in. So, so you're knocking at open doors here. Um, so just, just line up. Your, your, your experts in, in the area, whether it's from our 10 section on the Economic and Social Committee, whether it's from the European Commission uh, Department and your MEPs. I think you call, we're calling them pioneers, people who are really ready to forge ahead. Is, is that enough? I'm sure you're yeah. doing that. Well, no, I think it's always, whenever, you, whenever we're here and we're actually in a 
commission building and we're talking to people that operate here day to day. It's just incredibly useful to ask simple questions yes. like that because we don't all come to Brussels. And my answer was pick up the phone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I think we've all probably all written down that telephone number <laughs> and we'll try it tomorrow morning. Okay. But we'll report back. Um, any questions for Jen? So, gentlemen at the front. Uh, my name is Leonardo Chanelov. Uh, I've been making a research on uh, migrant e inclusion also. And I was uh, very happy to hear what says Madam Vice President, especially responsible use of internet, linking generation to avoid isolation, and the common access to internet. Uh, I would like also, I know Social Committee makes a good job on migrant inclusion and integration, but uh, I would like also to repeat once again what uh, the migrant is the most, uh, how to say, the most uh, weak part of society and now with this uh, war was around, goes around the Europe, they are our natural allies, you know, and they quickly and the better way we will use it. this uh, internet and uh, other sources for learning, they will maybe become to better actors to pass some development idea to their country of origin and uh, make this world safer and uh, for another better goals. And uh, it's just my small remarks, keep it always in, in head because uh, I think it's very, very important here to keep the balance and peace here and use these resources to try to influence situation abroad because only official institution, their efforts, it's not enough. It's clear, last decade showed. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Jane before we let her begin her busy day? Okay, can we uh, a final round of applause? Sorry, gentlemen. Gerhard Leitner, uh, governing board member of the Umbrella Association of Libraries in Europe. Uh, as you mentioned before, uh, IT gives the chance uh, for growing wells and for including the whole society. But uh, from the library side, we are extremely worried about the transformation of the information and media market in Europe, actually about the framework in which it is happening. We're seeing a growing gap between information poor and information rich, because, for example, uh, libraries are not allowed to buy freely uh, e-books, e-book licenses and lend it and give a fair remuneration to the right holders. This means that libraries are not allowed to give access to all citizens of Europe about information. And uh, what we're seeing that many peoples are left aside in this way. They don't get access. And my question to you is, how can you change it? We are asking for a change of uh, the copyright uh, that we can buy e-book licenses like we can buy printed books and uh, that we can give access to knowledge and literacy to all European citizens and what is your approach to it? Thank you. I knew I wasn't going to get away easily. <laughs> um, I've got to answer you from an not knowing anything about about the, the copyright and the e the e uh, rights for libraries, but I, so I'll answer you simply from uh, the same sort of question that, that you asked is to is to how to get the law changed. Now, first of all, I don't know whether it's been addressed in our opinions. I'm looking at Martin to see, and we're, we we don't think it's been that specific issue has been addressed in our opinions. So we need to. I assume make make decision makers more aware of the problems you have. Uh, so we've got to look at the commission, I would suggest, and I'm looking at the moment to see whether I'm getting a nod from the commission, and I am. So the people who are writing the proposals for a law need to be aware of the problem. And 
And it, a, a lot will depend on how big the problem is in terms of, I suppose, the change. And it, it looks as if it will become very, very big as, uh, as, as more and more access is used from e-books. Um, so you've got, you've got to lobby the commission. You can lobby through us, but directly to the commission to make them aware of this. There's another, if it's, a, if it's a very, very important issue for your readers, uh, are you aware of the Citizens' Initiative? The Citizens' Initiative, I, and I wonder, could you do this? Uh, if you get a, a million signatures uh, from seven European countries, uh, you are entitled, and this is just in our new treaty, you're entitled to make the Commission do something about it. Uh, it's quite a difficult, quite a long process, but I would suggest that libraries are in a very, very good position to gather signatures for that. So, depending on where it is in, in your priorities, if you want to work on a citizen's initiative, you might find something uh, that, 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 that's more relevant or not, but a citizen's initiative that, that works on that could be, could be something very valuable to you. I hope that I've helped answer a little bit of that question. Uh, thank you. Many thanks. Brilliant. And we can all thank Jane. Thank you.